I'd like to call the meeting of the special budget work session on Thursday, March 31st, 7 p.m. to order, please. Roll call. All right. Uh, Councillor Evans. Councillor Kaboski. Here. Councillor Lopez. Here. Councillor Paterna. Here. Mayor Pendleton. Present. Deputy Mayor King. Here. Councillor Kozakowski. Councillor Leidecker. Here. Councillor Gamble. Here. All right. Okay. Moving on, items for discussion. Item 3A, the general government proposed budget for fiscal year 2022-2023 will be the police department, emergency management, fire marshal and volunteer fire department. We will start with the police department, which is on page 101, please. Um, Mr. Maniscalco, did you want to speak to anything before we begin? There we go. Um, I, actually, we've got the chief and deputy chief here to answer any questions for all of you. Um, I think the easiest way, just for some of you who are kind of newer to the council, to look at the police department, there's they're kind of broken down, I believe, guys, into three three parts, four parts mostly. So, um, and I'm sure they can go over all that with you and give you a little bit better explanation. But um, this is really your chance to ask any questions you have of the budget and of the chief and deputy chief. So. I believe those have all been answered and sent out. If anybody sent something in, we got it and then sent out to everybody, so. Good evening, everybody. It's good to see everyone in person. And, uh, Good to be back in here. Um, I just want to, before we dive in, just give uh, a quick uh, public acknowledgement of the command staff at the police department who helped. Um, it was really a team effort to assemble and submit the budget request this year. Uh, years past, it's been a little bit more of uh, the chief and deputy chief, but this year the three lieutenants all chipped in. Um, I think they got valuable experience out of it, and I also think that they all brought to the table different levels of expertise. So we really tried to go through it with a, a scalpel as opposed to a, a chainsaw. And, and really be meticulous about what we were asking for and, and be generous about what we were getting rid of. And uh, I think that um, I'm confident that this, the proposed budget is the best um, package we could put together for the community and uh, for the men and women at the South Windsor Police Department. With me tonight, as manager mentioned, is Deputy Chief Eckbloom. I don't know if everyone has met him. I hope most of you have. Um, I'm gonna encourage him to, to pop up and down if I forget something or if I have the decimal in the wrong place or if I you know, start talking gibberish, then he's my, he's my, my security blanket. So Brian, by all means, <laughs> jump, jump in if I miss something. He knows this stuff, he knows this stuff as well as I do. So I, I encourage him to chime in. That being said, let's dive in. Do you want to, do you want to start? We could probably start with police administration. Uh, the total budget amount is $631,203. It's an increase of $26,174. Mm -hmm. Um, the increase uh, is largely due to um, projected and contractual salary increases. There are some other increases in, um, as you go through, and I hope that your books are the same, are marked the same line by line. If you see something, uh, for instance, in police administration account 320, the professional account, if you see something like on the bottom of after page 106, that first page, the fourth line item up from the bottom says psych exams, current employees, PAA. If you see anything throughout our budget that's marked with PAA, that's kind of my note to myself and hopefully a flag to you folks that that's something that is connected to the Police Accountability Act. Um, so for instance, a couple years ago, that psychological evaluations <laughs> or mental health evaluations for existing employees wouldn't have been there. So as you cruise through this, if you see PAA, um, that's what that is. a. a uh, easy to understand code for. So we had some in increases um, for drug testing, psychological evaluations, some projected salary and actual contractual salary increases. Um, I asked for um, an increase to the number of uh, academy tuitions, things of that nature. That's what's going to um, account for the majority of the increase in administration. 
questions about administration. All the various pieces that you just mentioned in the PAA, and that's under, I, I see that under the professional. Are you referring to, because you just mentioned a lot of bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. Are they in various areas and various accounts? Yes. Okay. Yep. So you'll see them. Um, the first one that we see as you go start going line by line through the entire budget is that psychological exams, current employees, PAA for $2,200. That's we're um, to satisfy the requirements of the Police Accountability Act, we're t testing, evaluating 20% of our staff calls for an evaluation every five years. So if we put people on a five-year cycle, we can do 20% a year. And that's what that, um, that dollar figure is. And if you jump down a couple line items, that drug testing PAA, that cost is not a flat rate. That will fluctuate because that testing is done based on an officer's certification period. This year coming up, we have a big class scheduled to be recertified. So that number is significantly higher than it was this past year where we had a smaller class due for recertification. But you'll see that PAA scattered throughout the entire budget. So when we go to page 107 and you have your professional account spelled out, and I have an increase of 1,610, that's covering all those items that you're referring to throughout this whole line item budget. Tell me again, I'm on page 107. 107. Yep. You have professional, yep. and that's an increase of 1,610. That includes all those required needs that you just mentioned to us. Yes. Yep. So drug testing is falling under professional, 2,910. Yes. Okay, so, but the way that it balances, it's just gonna be an increase of 1,610. That's what I've, I've done the math there to figure that out. Correct. Okay. So if we could just stay on that one page just for a second on the page 107. Yep. If you look under recruitment and training, mm -hmm. that's an $11,000 increase. Mm -hmm. And if we go over to the munis for the recruitment and training, where is the increase or the cause of the increase to be that large in that category? There's going to be an increase in um, the police academy tuition for um, on new tuition rates for three recruits. Um, there is going to be an increase in <coughs> in-service training went up. And again, that's the, that class of, um, that recertification class is much bigger this year, so we'll have to pay more per head uh, okay. per person to, to be recertified. I added five thousand uh, dollars to our training program, and, and just with with so many of the mandates and so many of the, the different assignments that we have and, and different um, specialties, <coughs> we run out of training money very quickly, and and we have to start denying people training. Some of it is more of a want training, so I'm more comfortable denying that. But when we start having to deny people more of a need training, that's when I get concerned. Um, so that uh, is a $5,000 increase. And then that was a $4,000 increase uh, for the academy tuition. So give or take, almost $4,000. Thank and you. And that was to add another, another recruit. Currently, we have three vacancies in, in the agency. Um, one will start a week from Monday, April 11th. And she'll go to the academy. We don't know yet when we'll be invoiced. Um, if we'll be invoiced this fiscal year or next fiscal year, she's gonna to go to New Britain's Academy. And then we have another young man who's this close. He's got a couple more tests to do. Um, and our plan would be for him to go to post in June, uh, the Academy in Meriden. And again, I don't know when we'll be, um, we would be billed for that one in the next fiscal year. And then we still have the other vacancy and just the laws of attrition in our agency over the years, we always lose one or two. Um, the, you guys, I hope noticed in the commentary there's a good strong handful of us that are already working uh, beyond our normal retirement date. So I cross my fingers that everyone doesn't go at the same time, but you have a lot of seniority and a lot of experience in that building that's passed currently today, past their normal retirement date, let alone those who will arrive at that date during the life of this proposed budget. Is there any overtime under the under this budget? A very little bit in, in admin. Uh, there's a small line item of $4,000. And where is that? 
it's the second line item in the the whole that section the second oh line I see it I got thing. it yep. yep and that's for which staff for the staff that work in the administrative unit yep so that's my oh well, I don't have overtime nor just deputy chief um, sergeant Bose is our uh, accreditation manager Kalia manager and Elizabeth is the office administrator and they're both eligible for overtime under their existing okay. bargaining agreements okay thank you mm -hmm. does anyone else have any other questions uh, Councillor Gamble thank you madam mayor chief how are you good how are you good thanks um, so you actually sort of answered uh, the questions I had around the, the vacancies you because I, I was looking at the org chart and I didn't actually see uh, the word vacancy in a box so I didn't really I was wondering if you had any um, that you had to fill and it looks like you have three that you were trying to fill as I go what yes, is, what is our, so our authorized strength is 46 okay and of that 46 currently we employ 43 so we're looking for 44 45 and 46 yeah 44 will start April 11th 45 we think will start mid mid to late May 46 we don't even have a, a, a name to pencil in yet um, so that's where we stand those are vacancies how by our authorized strength there are some vacancies in the building assignments that are, have been left vacant for the time being because I can't take in good faith can't take people out of patrol to put them into an administrative assignment uh, uh, example is our traffic unit supervisor mm -hmm. right now historically it's been that spots been filled by a sergeant right now I have it being um, temporarily filled by a corporal and that unit is usually three and they're down at two now but I can't in good faith take someone out of patrol and create a vacancy in patrol which is the 24 7 operation and put them into a unit like traffic so I have that one we just filled um, our narcotics assignment you probably remember last summer Ben Lovett uh, was tragically killed off duty so I left that assignment blank for uh, empty for a little while uh, for a variety of reasons and uh, we just last week or a week before that made the decision to fill that and we tested for it and we've assigned somebody to that so um, that's another vacancy that, that will be filled and I was confident in doing that because next Tuesday we have someone graduating from the Academy so there are kind of two ships passing one coming out of patrol and one who's gonna slide in there in the next week get field trained and he'll be up and running so it's a net zero it, it's a, a zero so loss. so you, when you create the, the budget uh, and for the personnel and the salary costs you really do it at a, at a level for 46 so, so you don't really have to worry about like people coming and going because it's gonna net out sort absolutely of correct. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. I budget for 46 and hope that I can get there and, and so do so there. since you lose like one or two people you figure and probably even more fingers crossed you don't mm -hmm. do you do some sort of re, uh, continuous recruitment yes so you're always trying to you know bring in new and 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 get free agencies I guess that you know yep. from other, so what other happened um, years ago we kind of had these recruitment periods where we'd open our recruitment for I'll say three months and accept applications and test and vet folks and try to film and it just wasn't sufficient so um, maybe six years ago we just kind of started to leave them open the recruitment window open for much longer <coughs> and um, our current recruiting window was set to expire or close today and we don't have the vacancies filled so we extended it and we just re reopened it at the back end for I don't know what Sergeant Clever did in probably just six months or a year huh. we can always close it but we right. just it's it's um, cost-effective and worth it to just leave it open thus we're part of a, a consortium that offers a written test which is the first step of the hiring process and they offer that test every month so that test was probably just this past weekend because yesterday or today um, in the last two days midweek um, applicants got their results from the written test and once they have a passing score they can submit applications so we, in the last few days we've gotten about 15 to maybe 20 applications which is encouraging yeah. um, we're proud to say and I hope you folks are are proud to hear it um, this young lady that's gonna start for us uh, on the 11th she applied only to us she wanted to come and work here you know a lot of times we'll see people scatter blast applications to whoever they just want to be police officers this young lady wants to be a police officer here because of the reputation of the department the reputation of the support that it has and the reputation of the community and I'm proud of that and, and when I sit down with new folks or prospective new folks I tell them we're the best agency in the state and I hope any other chief they talk to says the same thing and I'm not convinced they do um, but to answer your question yes we, we're leaving it open now because we're in a constant game of catch-up um, if someone if uh, who's agent Thompson corporal Thompson is our senior member if he comes into my office on Monday and says hey I'm done I'm giving you two weeks notice I'm retiring he's 30 years on he's, he deserves it he can leave Monday 
or he can leave two weeks after Monday, and then it's going to take at least a year for me to fill that spot. Wow. It's brutal. That's incredible. Yeah, it's really, you know, we'll wait. It's off topic. We'll wait and see if there's going to be a paradigm shift in state here. But um, that's the hard part is, is filling, keeping that gap, um, yeah. trying to close it as quickly as we can. And, and then my last question, it's not really to do with, uh, you know, the numbers of vacancies, but what is a public information officer? You know, you make that as an example for um, someone who has multiple assignments. So what is a public information officer? So that's our, who he does basically a media liaison. Okay. Sergeant Cleverton is the uh, person I just mentioned. He's in charge of all the recruiting. He does our training also. He coordinates training schedules and recertification dates and things like that. Um, he also is our press public information officer. So he's the one you'll see doing press conferences. He does the daily press release. Um, so that's what the acronym stands for, and that's he wears a few different hats in his daily daily duties. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Councilor Kowalski. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Chief, I just want, one of my questions, and you probably saw it, I, e I had emailed them earlier, but was mentioning, you had mentioned in here that the new mandates through the Accountability Act, what, I was wondering if you could quantify them, but I appreciate the fact that you did do that in here. So I just want to say thank you for doing that because that's I can go through now and just see what that's can actually cost the town. So yeah, thank those you for those were the easiest ones to quantify. Um, there are some that are training requirements. It's a little harder to put a price tag on because some people have the training, some don't. Mm -hmm. um, but something like a, a, um, a mental health evaluation, we know what the cost is. We know how many people there are. Um, so those are and body cameras is the, the probably the biggest price tag associated with. Um, with the Police Accountability Act. Luckily, we were well outfitted before the act, yep. um, and now we just have to backfill and make sure everybody has one. In fact, I just saw, I stopped in my office on the way here, and I just saw a big box in the hallway from that company, so I think that's that's them. They've been ordered, and, and they're here. So right. um, I'm guessing that's what's in that box. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Chief, I'm going to ask you, every year I ask you this question. <clears throat> you said we have 40, 46 total and we have 43 employed at this time. I understand somewhere along the way there is a specific amount per the population. I guess there's some rule, a numbering rule that you can have X, Y, and Z, how many of our employees we need. If you could explain that, please. Yeah, there's not a, a rule, a, a state statute or a policy that says this is a, it's not a, a, a definite rule. Um, but what we see, and I think what I, I, um, I forwarded was that per capita ratio and we use the capital region chiefs of police meet monthly and we all share data data on salaries data on department size data on percentage of department who's supervisors so um, that data i looked at the other day and um, there's a, a spreadsheet and it specifically has that per capita ratio and of the 24 towns who participated in that survey south windsor is smack dab right in the middle i think we were 11th out of 22 or, or 12th out of 24 i forget the exact number we were right there um, both in rank and numerically the lowest was I think it was 1.8 I'm sorry 1.4 the highest ratio was 2.4 ish and we were 1.8 we're right in there I think 1.77 rounded up to 1.8 um, so I mentioned that because I think that shows you know because there is no magic formula it shows we are right where our peers are in other towns especially towns of like size and, um, and towns of what I consider to be like means um, t comparable towns kind of when you look at your comps in your neighborhood with real estate our mm -hmm. comps geographically you look at them and they're all 1.9 1.8 maybe a 1.7 so we're right in there um, so when it comes to staffing the biggest challenge now is back to Councillor Gamble's question is f or what we kind of discussed is filling those gaps filling the vacancies um, if we bumped our authorized strength to 70 I couldn't hire that many you know, not that anyone would want to pay for it. We'd be way overstaffed. What we've tried to do, the deputy chief and I have tried to um, staff patrol so sufficiently that we can avoid um, where we can overtime costs. And there are nights where evenings is, is very heavily staffed. There's five or six of them working, where by contract there really only need to be four districts and a supervisor. There are some nights where you have six because you have a couple extras and you have Mason, the dog, running around with his handler. So there's a lot of people. Sometimes they're all tied up, and other times they're, you know, on a quieter night, they're, they're looking. So I don't want to put more there. Um, um, likewise, on the other shifts, midnights is considerably quieter than evenings, and I don't need that many. You know, we run three districts and a supervisor on midnights. There's always two dispatchers on the desk. Um, when you ask about manpower and do we need it, I can comfortably say we don't need more people with an asterisk. I am 
interested in and exploring um, maybe increasing our dispatch strength by one. Right now, um, their schedule is set by contract. So if I added, a, we have eight dispatchers, full-time dispatchers. If I added a ninth in there, um, it would mess up their contract and then breach the contract, and I don't want to do that. What I'm interested in doing, and I've started to, to talk to some, um, some colleagues, other chiefs, I'm interested, I think I'm going to explore entering into an MOU with them. Um, maybe not now, but a year from now with the next budget, and I'll talk with the manager and see what we can do in terms of adding an FTE. We haven't increased our, um, our dispatch strength in a while. We got our three extra police officers a few years ago, um, but we haven't increased dispatchers. And as we look at overtime and staffing, one of the issues in the support services account, which we'll get to, um, that's another big overtime account. And with only two people in there, if one takes a vacation day, we have to pay someone to go in there. But on patrol, bear with me as I ramble on. Let's say, hypothetically, on patrol, day shift, we need three districts and a supervisor. If there are four, someone can take the day off and we don't need to cover it, right? Because the minimum is three. In dispatch, if we end up creating a situation where there's three in there and someone needs to take a day off, they can run with two and I don't need to fill it. So I think that there might be some savings to be had there. Um, doing chief math, it, it, I think in my pea brain that it might work out. Um, but I would have to have the deputy chief do deputy chief math, which supersedes chief math. So there's research, there's research to be done there. Um, but I think that if, in answer to your question about staffing, if we have a, a, a need, a compelling need at cost savings, that, that's where I would really look. They're busy. When the, when the proverbial stuff hits the fan in there, it, it's brutally busy. I, I, was, I was surprised to see eight. And we have three shifts. So to have three on each shift, and you have folks take a vacation, you have folks that get sick or- Regular days off. The regular days yeah, off. Days I, I mean, to be comfortable to know that you have, your folks sitting there do, being able, you, you have enough coverage. Um, I, I would support that, absolutely, as long as you can figure that out and bringing that back, whatever, I would support that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but then getting to the police officers and looking at the support staff um, in the amount that you have, or even, I, I ask you this every year, do you need more openings to go from 46 to 47 or 46 to 48 in the sense that I ask you every year to make sure that you have enough bodies within your department and it, to help with the overtime. Um, and I know we've had this conversation in years past. Um, to reduce some of the overtime that folks are seeing, but if we increase an X with an extra person, um, I'm not sure what it would be called. Councilor Kowalski can help me out with this. Go ahead. Yeah, we were having a conversation earlier, and I mentioned the fact that if we bring in more people, mm -hmm. now there's, there's HR costs associated with that. Mm -hmm. So if, if we were looking to do something like that, would it be possible to do a cost-benefit analysis to say, okay, here's what we have scheduled for overtime. If we don't meet, if we don't meet that, then that's fine. But my thought was, if we bring in new people, those are fixed costs. Right. So if we don't need the overtime, it doesn't matter. Those those costs are still in there. Where with the overtime, my thought is, if it's needed, we budgeted for it. If it's not needed, we don't have to worry about it. Right. Um, there are we when we look at our overtime costs in the agency, there are oh boy, probably. 30-ish different categories that, that someone can get overtime for. So there's no discretionary overtime. No one's gonna come in and say, hey, I'm gonna think I'm gonna stay late and, and do some, no. You, you, the reasons we stay late are to get paperwork done for court the following morning. If you're out on, on a scene somewhere and it just rolls past the end of your shift, you stay, you finish the crash investigation, you finish the domestic, you stay at the medical, whatever the case may be. Um, so there are, when you look at the overtime expenditures, there are about, um, There was, in this fiscal year to date, so from July 1 to today, there were three thousand, just shy of 3,000 hours spent in dispatch shortages, staffing. There was a little more than that, um, well, almost, considerably more, 4,800 hours spent in patrol staffing shortages. But then there, those account for maybe half of the overtime budget. So then all the little ancillary ones, I stayed late for a call, I got called back to court, I, um, or some other ones. Court, DUI enforcement details, um, details at the Board of Education, community outreach, um, traffic investigations, support services callback, order ins, K-9 team. There's a bunch that are in there, and those also, 
I, I think of it, I was thinking of it today as my, my household budget. My mortgage is my big payment, but it's the trips to Subway, it's the soda, it's the groceries, all that stuff passes the mortgage very quickly. So the mortgage payment is the staffing shortages, but all those other little costs run right up there. And I don't, I th all those other little costs aren't gonna be impacted by staffing. That's when we have someone there. Um, so when you look at what the, you know, you mentioned the permanent cost for someone sh showing up, for us to um, take the time out of it, you know, like, if, like I said, if I were gonna fill a vacancy, it's gonna take me a year to do that at least. Right. Um, but from a dollars and cents perspective, it takes, it costs us just about almost $100,000 to pay, train, equip, and certify an officer. So and that's benefits also with I'm that? Sorry, no, that's not fringe benefits. That's just salary. So a salary, uh, entry level salary of 75, um, $5,000 worth of testing, doctor's physicals, polygraphs, stress tests. I forgot to add the stress test in there. Um, chest x-ray, polygraph, psychological, um, almost $4,000 for academy tuition, and then uh, about $7,000 for uniforms and equipment. Guns, ra the radio alone, portable radios, I think over $2,000 now. Um, so you arrive very quickly at 90,800 without paying for fringe benefits. And if you, so if you, let's say we say, okay, let's increase the department by two. Now for rough numbers, we're at $200,000. I don't think you're going to see that uh, in a direct savings in overtime in a year because of all those little bills in the household income. That, that won't cut back on someone having to stay late to finish paperwork for court or process an arrestee or whatever the other two Would one help? Are. It's hard to say. I'd have to really look at I crunch just... numbers. Um, if it did, it wouldn't help in this budget because I need a year to get them here. I don't even have the spots right. that we have filled. You know what I mean? So, and it, it's concerning to me also that we have the 46. There's 43 employed right now, and then I had read in the report, the town manager's report, we're working with 40 at this time because folks are out with injuries or sicknesses or, you know, FMLA, whatever the case may be, like to whatever it may be. Um, so, actively, we're we have 40 right now. So we're down six. But I'm always concerned. I mean, I'm asking you every year, do you need more? Yep. And that, you know? that level of people who are hired but just aren't on the front line, so to speak, you know, um, FMLA, pregnancies, injuries, um, long-term medical absences, things like that, deployments, um, those, that's par for the course. I feel like we always have a, a small handful, three to five, who are offline, we'll, we'll call it. They're not, they're either on light duty or they're absent, whatever the case may be. Um, so I feel like we always have that. And maybe, what, in the last couple of years, we've arrived at full staffing for like a weekend. It, and it was brutally painful. We had someone, we hired someone, they started on Friday, it was great. And on Monday, someone came in and retired. And you're right back to where you are. So yes, our authorized strength is 46. That's what we strive to hire. I feel like we hover around 40 to 43, depending on those other factors. Um, I can tell you that that's pretty good compared to what some of my peers, peer agencies are doing. Mm -hmm. They're struggling to get applicants, they're struggling to find suitable applicants, and, um, and they're really, they're having a tough time staffing. Mm -hmm. We have been fortunate that we have not had to chew into um, our patrol staffing. So that's when you call, someone's coming, that's fully staffed, that's why we leave traffic empty. Mm -hmm. um, we have had to borrow from the detective unit those, uh, those folks in there were nice enough to volunteer. We had one supervisor go out on FMLA due to a pregnancy. She's on light duty, <clears throat> so she's busy. We're keeping her busy, probably busier there than on the road. But those supervisors, instead of interrupting one's life for nine months, they've all agreed to chip in a month at a time. So they're going to midnights, working a month at a time and rotating. That's been a huge help to us. They've done that um, pretty much voluntarily. I haven't had to order anybody or you know, we asked if they'd be willing to, they said absolutely, and, and it's worked out. So, but I wanna reassure you that patrol unit, that patrol function is, is fully staffed. And you could argue maybe an extra person in there for exactly the reason we're, we wanna keep that buffer and, and keep a margin there so that if we lose somebody to an injury, we're still okay. Mm -hmm. Councilor Kowalski, I didn't mean to take the floor from you. I was just, go ahead. Just one, one question for Mr. Maniscalco. So in, in private industry, when we're factoring in a new employee, we, we just say, okay, for everything, 45% of their employee, we, of their salary, we figure as fringe benefits and everything else. Is that 
equate to yeah town so I, I mean so I think you could probably figure it's different for each employee because they have different contracts for each of the different unions so um, on a health insurance basis I think you'd figure about 28 to thirty thousand um, dollars in terms of the retirement I'm not a hundred percent sure of the retirement plan that most of the officers are on in uh, PD but it's probably around twenty thousand dollars as well so you're probably talking around 50 extra for those benefits you know so, oh, no. so uh, thanks so it'd roughly be like 140,000 to bring someone in 140 150 yeah okay for um, interestingly last year when we did the overtime budget we we looked at the five-year average and and it was actually increased to where it is currently and the the factor increase this year that I requested is just for lack of better words a, a cost of living as I s expect um, contractual increases then we're gonna I, I wanted to add that to the budget so we could have the same number of overtime hours available and um, we're right on pace for that amount you know this is I just did the math this morning we are 74.8 percent of the way through this fiscal year and I had a to year to date printout done this morning we're 74.3 percent of the way through our overtime budget so we're right on pace with what we have um, in I think that if, obviously if wages go up, I want it to go up to mirror that, but I don't think we need, um, luckily we made that adjustment last year based on a five-year average and it's, it's, it's rung true thus far in the fiscal year. Okay. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Is there any other questions for the administration piece? None? Okay, we'll move on to the next part of the police department. I think our conversation kind of bled over to operations, but just to, um, to kind of highlight the overall budgets for operations is four million seven hundred sixty three thousand six hundred thirty eight dollars which is an increase of a hundred and twenty five thousand eight hundred fifty eight dollars which comes out to two point seven one percent and that <clears throat> that operations budget book is all personnel costs there's no materials no equipment that's um, salaries overtime and that longevity line item And I think that's where that number on the overtime got me with by hiring a, you know, another person to reduce that number right there I'm by sorry. a little bit if we could. Say it again one more time. That that overtime number yeah. is what caught my eye. And I said, would it be better if we hired another person? You know, it, I don't know if that, that it would equate or not if we hired. Yeah, like I said, as I looked at the, the overtime valuation report this morning and um, and what our hours are and what the, the overtime purposes are, I, I don't think it's going to be a wash. I think you're going to lose. Um, it's all those little bills in your household budget yeah. that are that won't be impacted by someone being added to the roster. Does anyone have any questions concerning this department? Councilor Kowalski. Just one question. I, I may have asked this last year, and mm -hmm. I apologize if I'm repeating okay. myself. But is the longevity pay, is that contractual? It is. It is. Okay. Yep. And what we do is we, um, a, a simple, very simplistic explanation is, um, let's say, vacation time. If officers opt to get paid out for their unused vacation time or a percentage of it at the end of the year, then we have to have the capacity to pay them. Not all of them do. Some of them will use all their vacation, and some. So we um, calculate that off a five-year average. And instead of budgeting for worst-case scenario, because we know typically we're not going to have that, we go off a five-year average, and that's what that figure is. Is calculated okay. off of what we've seen. But yes, it is con contractual. Thank you. Any other questions on this one? No? Moving on, Mr. Maniscalco. All right. Uh, the next one is support services. Uh, that budget is $2,308,511, which is an increase of $220,230, or 10.5%. Oh, no, 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 no.
page 115 has the pie chart. I'm sorry? And right before 115 is the, the munis. I didn't know if you wanted to explain some of the increases under this one. Yep. Um, the figure that the manager just offered of 200 and, and change increase, 200,000, um, we looked at the numbers and the driving forces behind that were um, of that increase that you see in this, this uh, division. 210,000 of that is estimates on gas, gas, gas costs for a $59,000 increase. Um, new emergency medical dispatching software at 75,000 and adding back in a car that had been cut last year um, to the tune of 75,000 ish brought us to around 210,000. So that's the majority of those increases. Some of the other increases you'll see are um, materials increases, um, some minor minor changes in um, Narcan amounts, defibrillators, things like that. Those are all also contributing factors to that increase. I think the, the figure, if I'm correct, Mr. Manager, is $220,000, $230 increase. And of that um, gas, the EMD software, the dispatch software, and the car are 210000 of that. Gas is a gasoline contract that the town signs. Fortunately or unfortunately, straddles the fiscal year. It goes from July 1, no, I'm sorry, it goes January 1 to December 31st. So we know what it's going to be for the first half of the fiscal year. That contract's been signed. But for the second half of this proposed budget, we don't know yet. And, you know, we can speculate, we can read, we can guess, we can, who knows? And, and we'll see. And we try to take a, make an educated, not irresponsible guess as to what it's going to be. And then we sign that with Public Works also. So we get the same rate. So it's negotiated. Um, I think it's Chuck Marshall down at Public Works does that negotiation and research. And kind of we piggyback on that, that contract. Does anyone have any questions? Councillor Gamble. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Chief, so the dispatch software for $75,000, is that a one-time license fee or is that a now a subscription model that the that companies is, like to use? And it'd be $75,000 forever. Yep, that's a very good question. And I'm going to go to my my priority dispatch tab and tell you. Um, the, to, the simple answer is vast, vast majority of that is one-time upfront cost. There's a legacy cost, I believe, of... I want to say it was around six thousand dollars uh, annual license and maintenance fee. There's one for fifteen hundred. I think there was another annual fee built in here, into the quote. Um, to give you an idea, I'm sure you're wondering. We've all bought various softwares and apps and packages, and how did we arrive at seventy-five thousand dollars? And what is this thing? What is it that we're talking about? Um, if I can just, I'll, I'll explain to you. Currently, if you if we call nine one one right here, right now, something happens, and, uh, and we call 911. There's two dispatchers in the room. One's going to answer the phone and start taking information from the call taker. The other one is going to start to dispatch services. Always there's going to be um, two frequencies that, that the dispatching officer is on. They're going to be on a frequency with us, the police department, and they're also going to be on um, an ambulance frequency. If it's a crash with injuries, they're going to be on a third frequency, which is the fire department. If it's a real bad one and they need a helicopter, they're going to be on a fourth frequency. So that one dispatcher's hands are full with buttons and microphones and they're rocking and rolling. The dispatcher who took the call is extracting information from uh, the caller about what the problem is. Anything from um, uh, an altered mental status to an acute cardiac arrest. We've had um, a fantastic success story in the last month or so. I'm not going to steal anyone else's thunder in the room. Um, but that worked and it worked um, it was a kind of a perfect storm of circumstances and and I'm not going to dive too far into that but the dis the when the dispatcher answers that phone they're creating data in our record management system called nextgen and they're entering call information address patient name age um, gender primary medical complaint that nextgen system does not talk to the emergency medical dispatching system which is the other system they're trying to run the two don't, don't align, they're not synchronized. So they're, they're spinning two plates, they're that person in the circus who's spinning two plates and they're trying to keep them up, all while trying to pass information to the dispatching dispatcher. 
this product, um, this priority dispatch, links the two systems. So the call taking dispatcher will run on just one system. And th there's a few things that it does. Um, one is it really fine tunes what we call um, pre-arrival -instru pre instructions. So if we have somebody that needs CPR and we're not there yet, the dispatcher can talk them and coach them through that. This product is gonna streamline what questions to ask based on what the answers they put in. All of that is automatically imported into NextGen so the other dispatcher can see it on their computer and they know what services, they know if they need a, an ALS unit, advanced life support unit, a BLS unit, which is basic life support, and they can do that because they're getting it real time on their monitor. Um, the EMDs, emergency medical dispatching, this new software that's proposed software also would give us the opportunity to, we can't under our current medical protocols offer assistance with EpiPens or aspirin or any, any any medications. This would allow us to, because the pre-arrival instructions, the question and answer model allows us to do that. If we got this software, we could then make a request to our med control, which is at Manchester Hospital, and say, hey, this is what we have. This is the question and answer model. Can you expand our protocol so that now we can say, okay, is the person allergic to bees? Yes, they are. Okay, do they have an EpiPen? Yes, they do. Have they ever used it before? Has it worked? No. Okay, we take the EpiPen, uncap it, and it walks them through that. Um, the radio traffic is, is sometimes it's um, somber to listen to on a real serious one, but it's, it's eye-opening at it, it, how um, people are just distracted that, you know, in, under that acute stress, they don't process information the way we are now. Um, so I think that this product really would allow us to streamline. So we had that success story about a month ago. Fire chief knows who I'm talking about. Mayor knows who I'm talking about. Um, and then a week ago, I was standing in someone's driveway on Ellington Road and it wasn't a success story. I was standing with a wife and son whose husband didn't survive. Um, would this system have, have saved him? I don't know. Um, the circumstances were dramatically different in the two events, um, but I do know that in a situation like that, we can get more and more appropriate, more volume and more appropriate information to whoever's at that person's side at the, at the onset of that medical. Um, like I said, it's a, it's a big initial, um, a big initial price tag, a much, much less significant legacy cost. I do think with the um, demographics of South Windsor and the number of medicals we go to, I, I think it would be a, a fantastic step to streamline our dispatch operation and, and maximize right, people's yeah. chances of survival if and when that day comes. I, I don't want you to think that I'm um, not in favor of the software. I was just curious if the price tag was gonna be $75,000 nope, a that, year, every year. Yep, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's a, a fair it sounds question. like a wonderful piece of software that yep. definitely is needed it's for a, you know, the it's town. It's a fair question and I appreciate yeah. you asking yeah. and, and that's the, the most honest answer I can give you. I'm not a dispatcher by design. <laughs> you know, I, I can watch and listen to what they do and they're talented and, and when, when they're under stress, they do a fantastic job and uh, whatever the call is, but I think that this product would certainly streamline those efforts and get the best product to the patient as early as possible, and that's really the key. The reason we had that success story, I think the fire chief would agree, was a, it was a witnessed arrest, early, early defibrillation, early effective CPR. And if we can get those three components on scene right away, then that maximizes a person's chances of survival. The other one that had a, a, a tragic result was not a witness arrest. We don't know how long the person was down for. They were discovered there, and it just, we don't know. The circumstances are dramatically different. Um, so Chief, is there gonna be a yearly fee for this? Yeah, that's what I, I think it's gonna be. Um, going forward, and is our IT gonna give you a hand with this? Oh yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> okay. Remember, remember I talked oh, about Oh yeah, that. okay. <laughs> <clears throat> remember I said I don't that dispatch. That scared me a little bit, but okay. There's, oh I yeah. Said, remember I said I don't dispatch and there's a reason I don't dispatch? There's also a reason I don't work in IT. There you go. Um, yeah, the, the, there is a legacy of annual cost. And I, the quote is, um, I wanna say it's about $5,000, which is on par with some of the other systems well, we that's have. that's well worth it, but okay. Um, yeah, that's fine, you don't have and to. Yeah, the IT fine. would, they would do the, the install and the, right, right. all that, yep, absolutely. To make a dispatcher's job easier or more methodical or more um, having some software out there that can assist is absolutely essential to, to make, if, for everyone that calls in, absolutely. Um, with the, any other questions? No, good. Um, 
With, while we're in that same category under the maintenance contracts, I see that there's 69,000 for maintenance contract of channel two. Am I reading that one right? Or is that for the Axon camera, taser, weapons, and storage, PP, PAA? Let me catch up to you here. Yep, that's on the uh, Munis page 51. About halfway down on that page under the maintenance contracts. Yep, Axon camera, tasers, weapons, and storage, PAA. That's, um, that 69,000 is for that line item, the cameras and tasers. When you're saying cameras, are you speaking of body cameras? Yep. And we have to purchase that many when I thought we were pretty good on our, our um, I thought we were all supplied. We were about half supplied, just over half supplied. So I see. what we did this year um, was we had two contracts, one for the existing products. In fact, with, I think there were about five contracts because we bought them in stages over the years. So last year we, we worked with Axon, who's the, the vendor, to consolidate those contracts to one, which made our, our bookkeeping much easier. And then this dollar item, this line item, is a combined of the first, the combined five contracts, and then the new under the Police Accountability Act. So that's the total price tag. If we looked at last year's budget, you would probably see, um, you'd see a couple much smaller you know, like a twenty-four thousand dollar one, right? And then another one, but that sixty-nine thousand is uh, everybody is the together. total package. But it's not that sixty-nine thousand isn't new this year. It, I want to say it's about twenty-four thousand that's new this year. Okay. And is that going to happen year after year? Or is nope. that going to be just a replacement fee from there on? Yep. Yep. Okay. And the, and that those contracts have, because the technology changes so fast, the camera quality improves so dramatically, um, that. Those contracts have replacements every three years. They, it's like your cell phone. They take the old one, you trade it in, and they give you a newer one that's a version faster and clearer. Great. Yeah, that's not a, that, that cost won't change. Um, that'll stay fixed for the life of the contract annually. A lot of, the majority of it's um, data storage because there's so much, uh, so much data on the videos. And then we, I have a question about the police vehicles here, the hybrid vehicles. Mm -hmm. Last year was our first year, was it not on the um, hybrid? And how, right, I think, right? And how is that working for us on the, with that vehicle, vehicles? There's, we, right now we have two hybrids. Okay. To give you a little glimpse of what life is like in the, in the world of vehicle replacement right now. Please. Um, how many do we need to do and? Well, I'll tell you that of the, the three we ordered for this year, we don't have any yet. Two of them just arrived at the Upfitter down in Wallingford, and wow. they came from Ford. The third one is, we th think the VIN number has been created, so Ford made it. It's just not out of the factory yet and not arrived in Wallingford yet. So two of the three are in Wallingford waiting for um, some other equipment, cameras and computers and things like that to have the, up, the, the build up. Um, so we don't know how they've worked yet on the road. Do have two though that were bought. One was bought uh, for the canine for Mason. Okay. And it's had a, some mechanical issues early on that weren't really directly re related to the hybrid technology. Um, and that car is working very well. You know, comparably speaking, there's no noticeable difference either in performance or, or maintenance. I don't think we have enough time yet to really look at the fuel consumption data and savings and return on investment. Um, and then we have another one, car three just arrived and we have it on at the PD. It's wait, that one is also a hybrid and it's waiting for some last, um, two weeks before it goes on the road, so we don't have any real use data on that yet. Mm -hmm. um, from the field, from other agencies, state police have a bunch, other agencies have them, and, and the feedback is positive. There's really no profound problems with them. Um, I'm interested to see, because our cars do idle so much, because um, we have to maintain climate control for, primarily for the Narcan to keep it at a, in a te certain temperature range, um, I think that the hybrid technology will take some of the wear and tear off of the, convention, off of the motor when it's idling, it can sit silent for a little while. When the battery gets low, it'll turn itself on and recharge the battery. So um, I'm optimistic that, that there will be some savings there. Um, but for payload and performance, there's been no noticeable change that I've heard of. Mm -hmm. And there's so what is the replacement plan? How many vehicles do you have and how many do you intend to replace? And what's the schedule? If you don't mind. So we have 
Um, We have, remember last year we asked for four and got cut to three, which was fine. We ordered the three, we have two exist, the third we're looking for. Um, so what we do is each year we look at um, mileage and we consult with Chuck Marshall at Public Work Town Garage about um, roadworthiness. So we have the front row cars and the back row cars. The front row cars is just what we call it and those are really the, the, the newer patrol vehicles and each year there's six of those and each year we take the three oldest and rotate them to the back um, and then we trade in off the back row the three oldest there that are either they're costing us way too much money to keep and, and fix and, and repair um, or they're, they're getting high higher in mileage they're less much less reliable so that's kind of the rotation um, and then we always have to remember that someone inevitably, once a year, someone's gonna hit a deer and then the insurance company tells us what to do. Um, so that's kind of how the, the rotation goes. Because we lost that one, la there was a time uh, that I'm, uh, several years ago <clears throat> where we got cut a couple times and that's fine. You, you folks make, <clears throat> excuse me, you folks make your decision. We got cut enough times so that we started to really run into fleet issues. And then we had to have a year where we had to buy five. And that was a, a big price tag. So that's what I'm trying to avoid. Um, and by doing, um, doing four, three or four a year, we have some special purpose vehicles that are incorporated in there. Um, Mason's car, traffic cars, things like that. This budget this year doesn't include any of the lease issues that we had and talked about last year. That was a, those years, every three years or so, those are a different category. These are a, a little easier to, to handle. So. That's what we're trying to do is just keep up so as we lose them. Now, I meet with the command staff every Monday. We have our staff meeting and a few weeks ago, I think we had four or five cars that were offline due to repairs. We had one, a fairly new one, right? That was a motor failure. Um, so that one's offline for a long time. The motor just failed and we're working with Ford. They're gonna um, replace that one on warranty. Um, again, Chuck Marshall did a lot of work negotiating with them. It was, um, it was close on the warranty, but it's gonna be fixed by them. So that car's offline for a long time and, and that was a newer car. But when we look at front ends that have to be redone, um, axles, transmissions, those things are just not cost effective to replace on a, a car with high, high miles. So I'm trying to avoid that. We asked for the four last year. And um, to answer your question, this year we would replace it's not I apologize I, I fear it's not gonna make sense to you we would replace cars 4 1 and 18 they would become 9 16 and 13 and then we would plug in new cars so we're calling um, for this budget that we were discussing to replace um, 4 1 18 and 37 those are the license plate numbers that's how we identify. and those are the ones that are in the back row yes yeah, those are old cars. I'm learning your language here. I'm getting you. Yep. Okay. Those are those are the old ones. Um, so and then the we'll take the oldest of the front row or the and move those back and put those in back. So back row cars are, um, if a if run into if we have to take a, an arrestee to court, the detectives do that transport and they need a car with a, a prisoner compartment in the back, so they'll take that one. It's a back or a private duty or a, a parade, a, a traffic post at a parade or something like that, you can take a back row car. So it'll work, it, it's functional and it serves its purpose, but the front row cars, the strong, um, strong number of them, one through four, are probably driven 16 hours a day at least. One, car one's driven 24 hours a day. Car two is usually driven probably 24 hours a day. And then three, four, and five are mixed depending on who's driving, but they're, they're driven at least two shifts a day. And the one that's down with the engine is, is front row or back row? It was a front row car. Front row, okay. Yep. And out of the four, one, 18 and 37, mm -hmm. what is the, the, the one with the oldest or mileage on that or the, how do you know when it's time? What is, what's determining that that one, the oldest there gets replaced? 
I don't have it in front of me, probably mileage and, and mileage. repair costs. I okay. wish I, um, we had another issue today that we were discussing, so I got a, um, we keep a, a journal for each car, what the maintenance records are. <clears throat> Mike Kowalczyk does a great job. I had a question today about something in car six. Mm -hmm. He brought up the, the, the history, and we could see every time it went for an oil change, it had a blinking light, it would, and we can see the dates. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have that with me now, but the, the driving factor, the first consideration is mileage. Once they get up there in mileage, and actually mileage slash idling hours. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a factor that Ford gives us that every idling hour is equivalent to a certain number of miles. Again, I don't have that figure with me, but um, those are the things we're looking at as we No, move that's through. fine. I just think it's very interesting <clears throat> on how you determine your fleet replacement and how that works. I, I thank you for that explanation. And it it's, changes, like I said, because you can have all the best intentions to replace cars one, two, and three, and then car five hits a deer, and Karma says, no, we're not fixing done. it. Yeah. And then you gotta do it, it's a shell game. We're constantly moving and, and making sure we don't lose, <clears throat> we don't want the fleet size to go down, because there's plenty of days where front row and back row cars are all out, the back parking lot of the police department's empty because they're all out on assignment or, or a detail doing something. <clears throat> so looking at the repair maintenance on page 115, um, $56,097, it's an increase on that. Which account? Um, no, a total, I'm sorry, because on page 115 it has the, um, what is it? Is, oh, maintenance, no, I'm sorry, that is maintenance. Maintenance contracts, that's what that is. Never mind, we went over that. I'm sorry, I it's apologize. Okay. No, no. And under vehicles with the 59,000, um, on page 115, you have vehicles and equipment supplies. Is that the 59,000 is to equip the new vehicles? I'm losing, you have vehicle and equipment supplies on page 115 yep. for 163. No, 59,100 total, but it, under where it says vehicles and equipment supplies, is that broken down over here in Munis? Yes. <clears throat> in account. Is that pieces that need to go into those vehicles to bring it up to you know, move the lights, do the lights, do the. That's our Munich page. Yeah, I have that here. Yeah. Um, so when you look at um, the cars, account 442 is department equipment. 222. Four, uh, 442 is yeah. department equipment. But I'm looking at vehicle and equipment and supplies at the account of 222. Actually, um, the account that you're looking for, vehicle and equipment supplies, that's strictly gasoline costs. The gasoline that's costs, the got it. Thank gas. you. Okay. I'm good. And then the cars themselves and their associated equipment, parts, and components, that's a, uh, account 442, which is department equipment. Okay. Which on page 115 is. Oh, department equipment, that's on page. Oh, it's on the next page. 116, yep. on that's the next where all the page. That's cars are. Yep. And then in Munis, that account's broken down into the cars, the push, uh, not push bumpers, they come with the cars now, printers, computers, you name it, it's it's all. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Okay, did you um, anything? The four hybrid patrol vehicles, are they already purchased? They are not. No, we do, um, each year we do a letter of intent and it's non-binding, so the letter that I do says uh, it's to, to MHQ, who's the vendor, which is passed along to Ford, so they can say to Ford, all right, we're gonna buy 347 cars with state police, us, New Britain, Hartford, they are a huge vendor. So I send in a letter that says our intention is to buy four, and it's non-binding. I put in their language, says it's all, of course, contingent upon final budget approval by local government. Okay, so with that said, not to cut you off, so with that said, then that, because I'd look at that and it's for 61,000, uh, the way that the car industry is right now, we already know that they're out. I know Tesla's right now, for example, that are out six to eight months yep. minimum. So I guess more to my point is, is that price point, it's not set in stone. That is, yep, that's on state oh. bid, yep. 
So that's why we do the letter of oh, intent. So if they go up, then we're good. <clears throat> right. We'll still get the four at this price. Yeah, that, that yeah, letter of intent kind of locks us in at that price, if you will. Yeah, that's why we do that letter of intent every year to okay. lock in that price, which is through state contract. So I believe the, the price changes in like July or or is it April? Yeah, I did that letter. Um, when did we do it, Brian? A month? It was like a month ago or month something ago, like and that. It, MHQ, the vendor, said, hey, not for nothing, but if you're going to do this, get get us your letter. Right. Again, non-binding, but because Ford wants a due date so they can, I don't know if they turn the dial up to make them faster or turn it down to make them slower. But now, are you able to intertangle those, i.e., say, for example, if they come out with a hybrid truck, or is it just straight cars? Because I know that that's on the, the horizon. And yeah, the letter of intent is for the, the same the platform year. we have, the SUV. It looks like a Ford Explorer, that police interceptor SUV. Okay. <clears throat> yep. Good enough. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Not seeing any. We'll move on. Or are we done? Do we have another department? We have another department doing that. Yep. yep. Yeah, I think. Uh, community services. Yeah, 117 community services. Service. The yep. budget is uh, $196,499. That's an increase of $6,105, which is 3.21%. We have two, two full-time civilian employees in that, that account, that budget book, mm -hmm. and that is uh, largely for their salaries. And I'm going to jump to last year, this year's budget. Do we have a munis for this department? Oh, we do. I'm sorry. It's right here. It just was backwards there for a second. So I'm looking at the account 320. Uh, the the, uh, the fees for professionals has gone up 1500 mm -hmm. What is that reasoning? Account 320. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's all vet fees, uh, animal disposal, rabies, vaccination, and boosters, and feline leukemia testing. It's going up $1,500. For what? Have we vaccinations and boosters <clears throat> for the for our for the people, um, animal disposal, feline leukemia testing, vet fees. It costs one thousand five hundred for rabies vaccine and boosters for our employees. Do they not have health care? I mean, uh, doing eleven $1 hundred and fifty dollars for the in, rabies vaccines and boosters for employees. We have two employees. And the rabies vaccine and boosters comes up to one thousand one hundred and fifty dollars. Yep. Wow. You're required to provide that for them since they work with those animals per their contract. Okay. That's the that's the same every year too. Was that the same last year? That a line item was, yeah, rabies, yeah, was. vaccinations. There was an increase in vet fees, um, medications, and um, euthanizing animals. There are a few animals, uh, three, I believe, huskies that have been under our care. They were um, seized as part of a criminal cruelty case, and um, we've been paying. They were um, very, very neglected, and we've been paying vet fees to restore their health. Um, they've been down there for a long time. We're currently working with a a legal group out of Yukon that is kind of an advocate for the dogs. It's not for the owner, it's not for us, it's kind of a neutral third party and, and they're looking at trying to um, make adjustments to that plan through probate or through court so that we don't continue to have to foot that bill. It's, it's been expensive to get them their food and their shots and all that, um, but they, they are doing much better. They're much healthier than they were when we got them, but they've been with us for a long time. So that's, that's why we increased that line item. Now, is there a Husky rescue that they may be going to? Yeah, that, that's going to be up to the court. Because it's a criminal case, the judge will make a ruling on, on where the dogs go. I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't even want to speculate as to whether or not they'll go back to the owner. Okay. As a chief, I wouldn't want to speculate. Personally, I probably have a lot of opinions about it. But there's a, a big difference between the two schools of thought. And the repair maintenance facility is 10810 Yes, that's our share for tracks. Okay. Um, in the partnership with us, Manchester and East Hartford. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a figure that's based on um, percentage of what we call dog days. So if I 
if I find Fido roaming on Sullivan Avenue and I put him in there and he's picked up by his owners three days later, that's three dog days. If I find Fido and Sparky and the owners come three days later and get both of them, that's six dog days. So that's how we break down the usage of that facility. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you that our share is the, the least of the three partner agencies. Um, Manchester Shoulders, I think the bulk of it. And East Hartford is a strong second place. But ours is, ours is, uh, is the least of the three, but that's how we calculate it. Great, thank you. Is there any questions concerning this? Councilor Gamble. Thank you, uh, sorry, Chief, another question. Um, <clears throat> you had said that the two positions are civilians, so these are not actual officers? Correct, yep, they're not sworn, they, they're not armed. They're animal control officers, and, and we call them community service officers. They do a lot of non-law non enforcement things, so private property collisions they'll handle, um, medicals they can, re can and do respond to, um, all animal control cases from wildlife to domestic animals, um, so they, they can't do anything else other than this, right? They're not going out on patrols or anything like that. They work patrol. We have one on days and one on eves, but they don't patrol for criminal cases or stop cars or anything like that. Okay. They can assist with traffic direction and, and things like that. It crashes. They wear a gray uniform, you, you know, so if you see them out there, they drive a different vehicle, a pickup truck to mark animal control. Okay. Um, gray uniforms, but yeah, they don't go to the police academy. They don't have um, the use of force options. That They have a couple um, primarily to deal with animals. Um, if they heaven forbid they needed to, um, but yeah, they're different, to two totally different job, job okay. classifications. Thanks. Yep. Is there any other questions for the chief? Not hearing any. I guess we'll move on. That was our last department under the police department, right, chief? Yeah, street lights falls under us, but that's oh, it does. we don't manage that. That's actually a, a lot of um, conversations with the finance director about what the bill is and what the usage and rates are, and uh, and she has a lot of say as to what. Um, what that is it actually went down this year. We increased would, one line. The energy committee helped with that also because they identified what was theirs or ours or mm -hmm. getting better lighting and yeah, they worked on that too. Yeah, and I would suggest funding that to keep the lights on. That would be good. Okay. Thanks, Chief. I appreciate it. Okay. Appreciate what you do. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Security Blanket. Thanks. You've been wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, we can move on to emergency management. Uh, that budget is on page 120. Uh, emergency management is $24,985. It's an increase of $3,498. Just as a side note, just so everybody's aware, uh, this department does have a part-time employee, but that part-time employee is also shared with the fire marshal's office. Um, we're in the process of trying to fill that position now, so you can actually find that employee's salary under the fire marshal's office, not under emergency management. So just in case Thank there's you. a question about that. Good evening. Yeah. Good you. evening, Madam Mayor. How are you? Great. Good evening, counselors. Would you like to speak about emergency management or just So, as questions? the town manager said, uh, emergency management has actually been quite busy this year, um, assisting the uh, health department with COVID. Uh, we've also been planning a large uh, tabletop exercise that's gonna happen next week. Um, working with all the departments in town, uh, that's gonna be an all day exercise down at the EOC. Uh, we have hired Texas A&M, a professional emergency management company, to come in, run that uh, program, and then give us an after-action report, which uh, we hope to uh, pick out items to work on over the next uh, fiscal year. Uh, we anticipate um, we anticipate them to find quite a quite a bit for us to work on. Um, as the town manager said, uh, we. We did do first round interviews this week uh, with three applicants. Uh, we were impressed with all three. Uh, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be doing a second round of interviews and then doing an offer. So hopefully we'll have that position refilled over the next uh, four weeks on that. Um, this next year's budget is uh, an attempt to um, budget for some PPE. 
Uh, we, we don't anticipate too much uh, more from the state on that. Uh, so we wanted to put some money aside for PPE just in case another wave comes as there's one out, you know, in the opposite side of the world right now. And we also want to put uh, some funds aside for a full-scale exercise. Um, if the tabletop exercise goes correctly and we get good reports back uh, from the town manager and the assistant town managers that the full-scale exercise would be beneficial to the town and surrounding partners uh, that that is a little more of an expense uh, we have some funding areas to do that but to support that function uh, we put some uh, line items in here to uh, to hopefully do a full scale sometime next fiscal year on that emergency management um, it's myself right now uh, assistant town manager Scott Roberts and director of health Heather Otis uh, excuse me uh, we kind of manage it, uh, and then we do have that part-time employee to work on uh, emergency plans and action plans. We do have quite a bit of lists for that uh, new employee to work on. Uh, they will be quite busy over the next fiscal year. So that's kind of the summary of what we've been doing in emergency management, and uh, I'm here to answer any questions you have. Does anyone have any questions concerning emergency management? If you wouldn't mind, Madam. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Um, my question was about the uh, the tabletop and townwide disaster drill. Is is that like uh, you'd want to do that like every five years? Is that like every couple years you want to do something that that you know broad? Well, this one is our first one that we will be holding in South Windsor. Um, a few years ago, what four or five years ago was uh, Vernon, I think, held a, a regional one, and some of our employees. Uh, went to that and found that very beneficial. So I think over the next, uh, last few years, we've been kind of working up to this tabletop. And this is the same uh, company, Texas A&M University, um, that ran the Vernon exercise. Uh, they were very impressed with how they organized it and ran it. Um, so we took the opportunity to get them on the schedule. I would also follow that up with prior to COVID, the state used to run an annual test uh, tabletop drill that coordinated between the state and all the municipalities. Um, just from my personal experience in doing those, and I think from talking to some of the other staff here, um, those are not always as beneficial for the community itself. It probably works better for the state to test the state for what they have as assets and resources to pull upon. But as a local uh, municipality, it doesn't, it, it's not always the best of tests out there. So our hope is by doing something on a local level uh, as a tabletop on our own, we can actually really exercise and stretch our legs and see what we can do. Uh, the, the exercise that the town manager is talking about was just released uh, this week. Uh, that will be in May. And typically we'll have just a few major players down at the EOC to interact with those injects from the state. Um, this local uh, tabletop, as the town manager has described, be more intense and directed towards us. And we are actually going to use our LEOP that we have and run through the scenario and the injects to see if our LEOP actually works in a LEOP, real LEOP, please? It's the Local Emergency Operation Plan. It's about it. 300 Thank pages you. Thank you. like that. Yep. Yeah. Um, and that's a few years old, so we're going to exercise that plan, too. Um, and we're going to exercise the technology in the EOC. And we've also recently uh, updated our Everbridge. We've, over the last few months, come up with an um, operating plan for uh, the EOC. We've come up with how you activate it, how, what the process is, the policies. And we worked with Everbridge, and now everybody has an app on their phone. So if you're the incident commander, uh, and you get permission uh, from the town manager to open up the EOC. All you got to do is press two buttons, put your name, your cell phone, and it sends a message out. Department heads and certain uh, key uh, people in town will know that the EOC is activated, and we've created three levels within that policy. So you have a minor opening up to a major opening, and we go from there. So like when... There's thresholds in there too. Say we have 10% of our streets blocked like we did last year. Uh, the person can activate the EOC. There'll be six major players in there. So all the police, ambulance, fire, DPW, and the town manager as emergency management director 
we'll all be at the EOC. We'll have GIS there. We'll manage it from there. And it's good communication, and everybody knows what kind of what everybody's doing out in the field. So we're going to exercise that, too. We'll see how that goes. So if I could ask, while we're talking about that and doing a tabletop, will we have, I understand we received the grant to have our secondary dispatch center over there at the EOC. Will that be in place by the time this tabletop happens? There is no way to have that happen because I believe the tabletop is the fourth. Yeah, next season. <laughs> I'll bring you up to date on that project. Okay. Um, so tomorrow I have an appointment with Marcus and the uh, vendor for the furniture for the secondary dispatch. Uh, so she's going to come in, take measurements of the room, and we're going to reevaluate the pricing that we gave, uh, got to get that federal uh, spending money. So that's where we're at with that. The next piece of that puzzle is to get the technology uh, uh, for that system. Uh, so we're working with IT to come up with some pricing on, you're going to have the furniture, you're going to have everything there, but you need the computer to run the system. So we're going to be working with IT on that uh, uh, for the uh, secondary dispatch. Uh, we also got within the omnibus uh, bill, uh, they changed the reimbursement for storm IESIS. So they upped it to 90%. So we, we were initially, it's all 75% when we got it. So that's up to 90%. We don't know when we're going to obviously get that money, but we're looking at an extra $40,000, $48,000 coming back from the federal government for all the work we did with crisis track and everything to get that reimbursement. Um, it, it'll be paid forward here, hopefully another $48,000. So we worked on that too. Will you be coordinating with the police department on how many dispatchers you'll be able to have there? Two or three or three or one or? I believe we're looking at two stations two. Uh, okay. within the EOC and it'll, it'll primarily be a backup for the police department right. in the event that they can't dispatch from the police department. Right. So. right. The other one we have, the mobile command post mm -hmm. has the capabilities although minor, to be another uh, backup dispatch on that. So um, it'll be good to add to the system. Yeah, the goal is to actually have that dispatcher there so it relieves the 911 dispatchers to handle the routine 911 calls and then the storm stuff will be transferred down to that dispatcher and it'll run a little smoother and, and work together with the command staff. Right. Thank you, Scott. Any other questions? That's the emergency management. So, Mr. Mascalco, thank you, Walter. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, I believe next is actually the fire marshal, so don't go anywhere. Uh, page Change my one. Hat now. <laughs> yeah, put on a different hat. Uh, page 124. So, um, as you know, we're hiring the emergency management and uh, and fire inspectors. So hopefully, it will be back to full staff um, come shortly here. Um, I want to thank the town manager and the assistant town manager. In this fiscal year, uh, due to some personnel changes and everything, we had some extra funds within our, our part-time account and we were able to hire a temporary uh, fire inspector because um, we are way behind on our apartment inspections due to COVID and everything and um, I want to let everybody know that he has already scheduled up uh, Cinnamon Springs and for two three weeks out and then he'll be up at Parkview South uh, so we hope to have by the time uh, his position ends June 30th that that employee will get through at least three uh, apartment complexes and get us kind of back on schedule on there. So that's our goal in fire inspections. Um, the other part is um, we have a new um, program that does all our in inspections, violations, court notices, and everything. 
and that's a cloud-based system now. And it, it's a tricky program, and I'm not tech savvy. Luckily, we hired a uh, Deputy Fire Marshal Wayne Optenbrow, who's very tech savvy, he's a retired state trooper uh, with the Fire and Explosion Unit. I was, we were very glad to, that we could talk him into working for us a little bit. And uh, he will be the main point person for that program. <laughs> And they run a advanced training every year down in Austin, Texas. Um, this year, we're not sending anybody. But one of the goals in the training budget is to send that employee down there to network in that system and bring back a lot of knowledge and help us run that. Is this a system where you're out in the field on your phones or laptops and you can go ahead and enter your information? Yep. So right now, uh, uh, we have Fire Inspector Seth Vennick here. He's one of the apartment inspectors that we have. And when the inspector is out in the field, they actually are doing everything on the iPad. They're doing the violations. They can take a photo of the violation. They have the uh, owner or the occupant sign that violation, and it's actually emailed to that person right then and there. And during new construction, we, we keep track of all the new construction inspections, take you know all the same stuff. We, we had to switch to was cell-based iPads, and you'll see that in here in the budget, we have to reimburse uh, facilities for that cell charge. But it has increased our efficiency with the limited man hours that we have to really uh, do a, a great job out in the field. And uh, the building department is now switching over to some of that to do that with View Cloud when they're out there doing their inspections during new construction. So. Uh, and all that information is printable, right? There will be a paper copy if needed. Oh, yeah. To keep yep. Okay, yep. good. Okay. Yep. And is there any other questions for the fire marshal's office? Not seeing any. Thank you. Mr. So Summers. we have, I have one more. Just oh, like I'm the, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, also under my uh, purview is the hydrant and water lines. Right. Uh, that just went up 10500 this year. And those, that line is, is all fixed costs that we do with Connecticut, MDC, and Manchester. Very good. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Mr. Maniscalco, I will be, um, and counselors, I will be recusing myself for the presentation of the fire department budget. And the deputy mayor will take over. Oh, that's funny. I was like, oh, my God. Got it. Yes. Yes. What I'm passing out now is just a copy of the email. I don't know how many of you, were, like me, are inundated with emails. Maybe you didn't see it, but that's just a, basically an overview of the fire department. Uh, we're a little different than most of the department heads that you're seeing during this budget process. We're, we're a great agency. So as a great agency, we operate completely different in some aspects and other aspects very similar to other department heads. So that's just an overview of that. Um, those of you that couldn't make our educational sessions, by all means, um, be happy to answer other, any other questions regarding that, um, even though that's not what we're here to discuss tonight. But I want to make sure that's very clear. We sort of simula simulate to how we operate with the Board of Ed. With the, We have a Board of Fire Commissioners, just like they have the Board of Ed, and they sort of help us prepare our budget and has to be approved by them first. So our budget process is um, much more involved before it gets to this level where our staff develop our budget. And I can't thank our staff enough for doing their budget presentations and getting everything ready for them. Then it goes before the Board of Fire Commissioners. They scrutinize it, they cut it, they cut it back. And then it goes to the town manager, his staff, and they, they review it with us, answer any questions, and it gets to your point. So that's where we are tonight. Um, I know some of you had asked some questions already, so I was hoping I, I was able to answer those questions to the best of my abilities up to this point, but uh, by any stretch of the imagination, if there's any other questions or um, follow-ups to the questions you already asked. Um. Counselors, any questions? The chief? So, yes, counselor. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the hydrants and water lines, that's what uh, the fire marshal was talking about, but it's, I see it under your. What's that? I see the hydrants and fire lines is uh, that's not under your budget? No, so as a great agency, I'm not even familiar with the Munis book that you have in front of you, okay. but all that comes under the fire marshal's office. Okay. I think years ago, when we had the fire marshal, who was also the fire chief, the hydrants got put under that. It sort of makes, in my mind, no sense that it's under the fire marshal's budget because the hydrants have nothing to do with that. But that's just where it is. That's where it's been for years, and that's where it stays for now. 
Uh, that's something that the town manager can always look at down the road if he wishes to change it, but the hydrants fall into the fire marshal's budget currently. Yes, Councilman Bass. Thank you, Deputy Mayor King. Um, Chief, thank you for answering all my questions. Just one follow-up question to the, where you mentioned the replacement of the portable radio straps, batteries, and pagers. How often do those need to be changed out? Well, the majority of the increase this year is just for the straps. Those are typically multiple years that we get out of the straps. We replace all of them at once this time because we're, we're short so many of those. Uh, the portable is every now and then we buy two or three a year. We buy the batteries two or three as we need them. So we're not replacing the whole fleet of portables and batteries all at the same time. Um, this year, just a little increase because of the straps. They're all leather straps so they can you know, withstand the, mm -hmm. the conditions of the firefighting and stuff. So, Thank you. Councilor Paterna, Councilor Idecker, any questions for the chief? Uh, one quick question, chief, and please correct me. I believe, and I don't know if it was in last year's budget, but there was an authorization for your department to purchase two new vehicles, like a, a rescue six, and was it a pump truck? So the vehicles are replacing our rescue truck, our yep. large toolbox and wheels, and then a new support vehicle. Those funds are separate from the operating budget. Okay. Those are part of a 10 year lease. All of our fire apparatus, we have a huge plan that encompasses uh, the replacement of all of our fire apparatus over a 25 year span. Um, and typically, um, and with the town manager's blessing, how we do that is through a 10 year lease. And I say lease, it's different than a lease that you and I would get for a vehicle. It's really a loan, it's a 10 year loan. Um, but they call it a lease for municipalities. So those two vehicles, along with the air packs that you just helped us replace, all that was part of a 10 year lease. So we haven't, those trucks are still on order being made now. Okay. One of our committees just went to Long Island last week um, for the support vehicle for the mid-trip inspection. The rescue truck is about to um, be scheduled for the mid-trip inspection. So we're looking at May or June because of all the other COVID related issues. Those two trucks are pushed back a little bit further. We were hoping to have them back for April but now it's looking like May or June, so. But they're separate from the operating budget. Okay, thank you, I couldn't yeah. quite remember that. Yeah. And then it looks like with everything this year, your budget is only increasing 30,000, roughly yeah, so 39? It's a little confusing because last year, and I go back two years, in 2021, our budget was $1,011,088. The current budget that we're under operating under now was a $29,000 increase over that for a total of $1,040,210. But at this time last year, we never asked for any increase. So we got the same allocation that we did the previous year because of COVID. We couldn't spend some monies, um, training academies are closed, some of the banquets we didn't do, all those kind of things. So mm -hmm. that $29,000 increase, we were able to carry over the funds from our previous budget to this year. So um, the increase this year is another, um, $38,957, so just under 4% increase under our operating budget that we have now. So the last time we had an increase in the town was really two years ago. Mm -hmm. So it looks like a, a big increase together, uh, but it's really about a, a just over a 6% increase over two years. Um, the first year was 3% and this year is just under 4%. Um, and the vast majority of the increase this year, uh, spelled out in your paperwork you already have, is uh, mostly for the fire chief stipend we're adding a second lieutenant position. Yeah. Um, the events is a little confusing too because of a typo. Um, we currently pay our members $9 an event. It's not an hourly rate, it's an event. An event is anything official. Every response we go to, every training session we go to, but it does not include social activities. So every time we do anything social, we don't get reimbursed for that. It's just for the official stuff. It's been about $9, I, I can't tell exactly, but it looks like about four or five years has been $9. That program summary that you have in front of you is a boilerplate of how our line item budget categorizes things. The dollar figures change every year, but the boilerplate doesn't. And within that was the $8, so it's a little confusing to some of you to show that it was $8, so it's really $9. I'm proposing that in this budget it goes to $10. Um, and I, one of you asked, and I don't know which one it was, um, how we come up with that figure. And, um, Basically, it's a very educated guess on our call responses, but it's, it's hard to tell how many members are gonna respond to how many calls we have. And we pay that out twice a year, so that category's been increased by $14,000 this year. Um, 
fuel because again we don't know what's going on with fuel we increase fuel two thousand dollars and um, this is a good time to talk about the cooperative efforts with the town we pay for our diesel fuel through this budget for the fire apparatus but we get our gasoline through the police department so all of our support vehicles the duty vehicles they see around town my vehicle the van all those vehicles run on gasoline and that all comes either out of public works or the police department and it's not paid out of our budget um, similar to uh, shared shared services is the dispatch center you know i know the chief talked about possibly adding a third dispatcher or things related to the dispatch center i would fully support that as another agency that uses that dispatcher center immensely um, our call volume is going up higher so obviously the dispatchers are busy just with us alone we're also trying to be much more compliant with nfpa national fire protection association requirements and what the dispatchers do for us and how they document it so their workload just on our end is increasing the medical calls in this town are going sky high so uh, with the five assisted livings um, those calls are just skyrocketing so the dispatch center i would certainly support any efforts that the chief is proposing for the dispatch center Mm -hmm. um, again, that shared communications, shared services with the fuel. Uh, we're very blessed, the capital projects, we've had a lot of projects that are either completed or ongoing now through capital projects that, that, that don't come out of this operating budget. And just to quickly highlight some of those things, we have a brand new generator that's um, in the works. If it wasn't for these COVID delays, we probably would have had that installed at the headquarters already. Uh, we're two years into a three year key fob project for all, fi all three fire stations. Um, we're working on a replacement for the HVAC system for headquarters and potentially a new roof of headquarters, all out of capital projects. And in the past just a handful of years, we replaced the parking lot of headquarters out of all that. We replaced the generator station two out of capital projects. So there's the operating budget for the fire department. There's the leases for the fire apparatus. There's um, capital projects for all these kind of things. And then there's shared services like the gasoline and um, even fleet maintenance, they, they manage all of our smaller vehicles. So Chuck Marshall and his staff service all of our small vehicles and whatever fees are involved in that, that's covered out of their budget. Uh, the only time our operating budget talks about maintenance is the maintenance of the fire apparatus. It has to go out to a third party vendor. So uh, does that help clarify any of yeah. those things? Yeah. It does, thank you very much, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Council Paterno. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Chief, first of all, um, Thank you and your staff and the members of the fire department for all the great work. Uh, when I tell people in other parts of the state that we have a town of 26,000 people and we have a volunteer fire department, they're in complete disbelief. And then when I tell them the other towns call on our fire department for help when they need assistance, they really think I've lost it. Okay, they can't believe it at all. So thank you for all the great work. Now, I want to go back to a couple of years ago, we were discussing the air packs yep. and upgrading. So are we at the point where everything is now up to date and been upgraded? Thanks to the efforts of both the town manager and you, yourselves, yep. we were able to purchase and replace all of our air packs um, Great. within the last year um, at a tune of a half a million dollars for all of the air packs. So every one of our air packs now is compliant with the new ones. We were going, we stuck with the same vendor so we could use the same bottles because the right. bottles are obviously related, interacting with the air packs, but they're separate. Right. If we had changed vendors, we'd have to probably have another at least $100,000 for bottles but by saving with the same vendor, our bottles are still being able to use the same bottles. And in our operating budget, we replace about 11 bottles a year, so it's an ongoing replacement for the bottles. I'm working with the town and my staff on a sort of a plan to 25 years from now, when we have to replace all the ear packs, right. what that plan is going to be instead of coming to you again for another huge request yeah. at the last minute. So. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm glad we're up to date. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions for the chief? Deputy Mayor, uh, just one quick question. Um, first, or one item. First of all, you could see the lease payments uh, for those fire trucks on page 229 in the cap lease budgets. If you're interested, in your in your binder. Yep. And then the question I did have for the chief, um, because some of our largest uh, expenditures that we have sometimes are are our fire trucks. What is the next one coming down the road? So the next one, well, if you look at our plan. And when. <laughs> yep. Um, and according to our plan, for the number of years now, and between ISO, the insurance services offices that sort of rates the town right now, we're a 4-4 under the ISO rating, which affects all of your insurance ratings and the business community ratings. Um, the goal is to be a class one, but it's very challenging for, in Connecticut, there's only one class one, or two class one fire departments in all of Connecticut. 
and very few are volunteer fire departments. So a 4-4 is very good for us. So in their ratings require or suggest a second ladder truck. We only have one ladder truck now. Their suggestion was a second one. We've had some challenges in our own selves to sort of defend that request. So we haven't required that yet. Uh, between the hotel, the sister livings, and all the other large development, it's starting to be time to start looking at that. So in 2023, the next pumper is due to be replaced, and we've been kicking a second ladder down the road. So the concept is that to replace that second pump, or that pumper rather, with a combination ladder, so we don't have to buy two fire trucks, mm -hmm. we buy one that's a combination of a ladder and a pumper. Um, scheduled for 2023, although I will tell you that by age and by the plan, that's when that's scheduled to go, but that truck is in awesome shape, and I don't know if it's worth kicking it down the road a little bit. Um, there's pros and cons of doing that. If you do that, then you're you're losing value of the truck when you try and resell it, and, and you're also taking that risk of having other issues down the road, but currently it doesn't need to be replaced immediately, but that's the game plan is in 2023. We start that process. As you can tell, it takes almost a full year from the time we even order a truck. Uh, our committee is, we have an exceptional committee, and I will tell you, our chairman of our committee is a guy with more talent and education than if we had to hire a consultant, and you talk about replacing fire trucks and specking out fire trucks, we couldn't afford the talent that this man offers us as a member of our department. Uh, we are so blessed in so many different ways with our membership, but this is just one aspect where this gentleman is just anal, beyond anal about specs and understanding specs and talking with the engineers and developers where you couldn't hire a consultant and we, we have him for nothing, you know? So um, we've been working with him to combine those two into one for 2023 and it'll probably take the committee six months to even come up with before it comes to you. So mm -hmm. I'm guessing 2023, 24, we'll be looking for some suggestions okay. and moving forward and then we wouldn't be paying for it till 2025. Yeah, we, we typically, just so the council is aware, we typically try to look at that cap lease budget to see when there will be different uh, rolling stock coming off that yep. we can then put into there. So th something like this is important for us to know, so that way we try to mitigate as much of the impact to the taxpayers as possible. So. And that plan is certainly available, so maybe after the budget season, if you like, we can, and I know a lot of you new councilors may not have even seen the plan or don't know what I'm talking about. I'd be happy to, you know, have a meeting afterwards just to discuss the apparatus replacement plan. Mm -hmm. That's a plan in itself that's worth understanding. So not only is he aware of it and complain for it financially, but you're all aware of it too. Instead of just coming to you tomorrow and saying, I want a million dollar fire truck, you know, um, there's a plan for that, so. Great presentation. <coughs> I get to meet the guys. Um, I met you, the gentleman you my you're question. talking about, who's kind of like the consultant. But then they brought us coffee and donuts, so it, it was a good evening. <laughs> Not going to follow that. Uh, <laughs> any other questions? I have one, sir. Uh, of course. Thank you. They were munchkins. Oh, good to know. That does oh. not answer my question, no. So I, I know that there's a whole bid process and everything, but a combo truck, are we talking like 1.5 to 2 million? Like what is the, like, what is the ballpark? If you order it today, I would guess around 1.5, give or take. Yeah. Just Depends on what you do for options and you know uh, what we really determine is that our need is for that. Uh, the length of the ladder is gonna be a big value of the cost. So uh, we have a 100 foot tower ladder now that's not due to replace for a while, so. <laughs> mm. um, uh, but we, whether we go with a shorter ladder or a different type of ladder truck, it's all different options that we have to look at and figure out what's really gonna meet our needs in our community. Just like keeping us a volunteer fire department for as long as I can, we still compare that to the community needs. How long can we maintain being a volunteer fire department based on the community needs and expectations? Uh, the town is growing, I've been here uh, I don't know about longer, as, as many as some of you, the town's changed drastically. So whether we can continue keeping up with that, uh, that's our goal, that's my goal, is to keep us a volunteer fire department. The, the budget approval process, the incentives that you offer for our firefighters, whether it's this increase of $10 an event or whether it's a tax abatement program, all these different things certainly help to keep the volunteers alive. And um, I, I think I have to give credit just to take a few more minutes of your time to our training division. Um, we're not burning down houses every day, thank God. We're not, you know, taking people out of cars every day. And that's what most of the guys are here for, is to do something, right? They're not, they don't want to see any destruction, but they're here to do something. And in lieu of health calls, the best way to keep the men motivated and dedicated is training. 
and we have an exceptional training division that keeps the guys motivated, the skills. I would put us up against any fire department in the country. Um, and you know, to your point, um, I was just calling you mayor, but I don't wanna be disrespectful to the real mayor at this point. But um, you know, we went to Broadbrook twice in the last couple of weeks. Um, their system, they ask for two of our pumpers in our crews every time they call for us. Instead of just one, typically we send one fire truck, they ask for two. Um, and every time they've asked for two, at least you know, in the recent times, we've been able to provide that. And we've been able to provide the manpower to go with that and still protect our own community. Um, and their chief calls me every time, he's like, how do you do it? We had 17 guys over there. They just had a fatal fire a couple weeks ago. It was our crew that found the guy or the lady. Um, so our crew is are exceptionally well trained. They're very well respected in the community and outside the community. And I can't thank enough of all of them. You know, I get to be my job as really the cheerleader of, of what we do. And I appreciate your thanks. I pass it on to them. But we are very blessed to have the crews that we have and the people that we have. So, so. anyone else? You're good. Awesome. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Appreciate you staying the whole time. Thank you very much. If you want to uh, let the mayor in back off of punishment, that would be great. Thank you, Deputy Mayor King. <coughs> okay, so we're all done with our department presentations for this evening. So is there a motion to? Uh, just sure. One comment. I just saw that, Councilor Kabaski. So I talked to the town manager yesterday um, about the fact that, so looking at the budget book this year compared to last year, and then grabbing a copy from the previous year, I like the changes in the budget book this year. Um, as somebody who works in financial reporting, between the charts and the breakdown um, it's very impressive it makes it easy for somebody like me who was used to looking at this stuff to go in and pinpoint what it is i'm looking at so i want to thank you guys for that it is very impressive work and much appreciated so thank you absolutely yeah. easy to follow good job <laughs> thank you <laughs> Is there any other comments or questions? Not saying any. So Madam Mayor, I just wanted to remind Absolutely. I wanted to remind the council that we have our next budget discussion regarding the building department, finance, planning, and public works on April 4th. So if anybody has any questions, you can uh, forward those on to myself. And uh, I would just follow up uh, Councilor Kabowski's uh, comments and say Jess did a great job with the budget book. Sure year, did, so. thank you. Good job, good job. Anything else, folks? Not seeing any. Can I have a, a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. The mo uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. Not hearing any. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening.